preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Good evening and welcome to our lecture series on the First Amendment. My name is Alan Slifka and I'm delighted and honored to welcome you this evening. My honor stems from the fact that my wife Virginia is a board member at the Y and I'm a Yale graduate. Uh, the Y would like to take this moment to thank the Philip Morris Company for their sponsorship of this series. Tonight's lecture is entitled Freedom of Expression in an Age of Anxiety, and we are honored to have with us one of the foremost experts in this field, Benno Schmidt. Benno is president of Yale University, former dean of Columbia Law School, and an internationally renowned scholar and lecturer. He has been at the fore in this area of constitutional study virtually his entire life. He is a legal scholar who specializes in constitutional law, the history of the Supreme Court, and, uh, and, and, and aspects of mass communication. In, in 1973, he and a Columbia colleague, in response to the federal government's prior restraint concerning the Pentagon Papers, wrote an article which is considered the definitive analysis of espionage laws. It was entitled The Espionage Statutes and the Publication of Defense Information. At the height of the Watergate crisis, he was the principal author of the Bar Association of New York's report on the law of presidential impeachment. He continued to explore First Amendment issues in his book, Freedom of the Press versus Public Access. He has served as moderator for many Ford Foundation-sponsored seminars on the role of the news media that have appeared on television. He is a graduate both of Yale and the Yale Law School. And as a Yale graduate, I am proud of the scholarly approach he has devoted to his field of endeavor over the years. He has a, had an illustrious career of service and it's a, uh, a privilege to uh, have with us tonight a man who has served uh, both Yale and his country through his uh, work in uh, uh, concerning freedom uh, uh, this evening. Uh, I'd like to also, if I may, announce that following Benno's talk, that Yale graduates are uh, welcome to attend a reception uh, to meet with Benno in the art gallery adjacent to this auditorium. And, and now, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Beto Schmidt. Thank you very much for that warm and very friendly Yale introduction. I feel right at home here at the Y. Uh, this is not the first time I've lectured here, uh, but having enjoyed for so many years uh, the unique programs, cultural programs, uh, intellectual programs, and programs of art here in the Y, it's a pleasure to come back and lecture, I hope in some small way to repay the debt that I feel to this marvelous uh, organization uh, for its tremendous contributions to our culture. When I accepted this invitation uh, now many months ago, I thought I would talk about a number of different issues of freedom of expression here in this bicentennial year of the ratification of the Bill of Rights and, of course, the First Amendment first among the Bill of Rights. These various issues, however, organized around a a single concern, a growing concern indeed, that we are living through an age of anxiety in our society that is unfriendly to the protection of enduring principle in our national life. An age in which this anxiety especially threatens principles of freedom of expression those principles that 
as Cardozo reminded us, are the indispensable condition, the matrix, as he used to say, of all the other freedoms we enjoy. Uh, the subjects I had planned uh, to talk about a year or so ago that I intended to canvas uh, included the controversy, may it rest in peace, over flag burning. I thought I would talk also about the uh, politics of the absurd, if I can put it that way, that has recently played itself out over the problems of uh, indecency and offensiveness, and in some sense a sort of general wackiness in the arts, or what has the pretension to call itself art these days. And I also thought I would talk about the, our momentum as a society uh, to tend toward a regime of national security secrecy that it seems to me has more in common with the philosophy of Mrs. Thatcher than the values we ought to have learned from Oliver Wendell Holmes and Louis Brandeis. Much as I admire the legal traditions of Great Britain, its notions of freedom of the press are still, I think, more in keeping with the monarchy of George III than the democracy of George Washington, not to mention George Bush. And finally, after canvassing th these issues, I plan to talk about uh, anxieties in our universities, where I think freedom of thought is in danger from well-intentioned but misguided efforts to give various other values, uh, give er various other interests uh, a higher place in the university uh, than the value of freedom. But as the months uh, went on and as I thought about this talk and prepared for it, I, th I thought, and I hope you will not find this parochial, that I would elect tonight to focus my comments particularly on problems of freedom in our universities. I do so because I have come to the reluctant conclusion that the most serious problems of freedom of expression in our society today exist on our campuses and not in our courts. I say that partly to go back to some of these other subjects. I say that partly because I think we've been diverted as a nation. I certainly hope so from the outlandish notion that we ought to amend the First Amendment for the first and only time in 200 years, an amendment that survived the cauldron of the Civil War, two world wars, the rise of fascism, the anxieties of the Cold War, that we ought to amend this two-century year old foundation of all our liberties to deal with what? The surpassingly trivial problem of flag burning by a few silly hotheads. I remind you that majorities in both houses of Congress uh, voted to do exactly that, which I think must have made James Madison, uh, if he we're watching 200 years later wonder what is going on. Uh, and I, my concerns about the other issues of freedom I mentioned uh, uh, have lessened, I guess, less than that first one. I, I continue to be concerned about our tendency toward greater and greater secrecy in matters of national security, and I mean that generally. I have no concerns about the security of ongoing military operations, uh, none at all. But we have been on a tendency as a society to broader and broader uh, proscriptions of expression in the national security area, 
And of course, we have all watched the tendency of our politics to tend to want to try to convert the difficult uh, and intrinsically somewhat vague proscriptions against obscenity into uh, blunderbuss weapons that could be used against just about any sort of expression that is offensive on just about any grounds. But, it, but in these areas of national security secrecy and expression in relation to the arts, there are strong institutions in our society and powerful interests and considerable public concern with threats to freedom in those areas. The issue of freedom in universities, I think, is somewhat different. The institutions in this area which ought to be fiercely devoted to freedom, the universities themselves, seem to me distracted and confused. I think the general public is coming to comprehend the dimensions of the problems of freedom on many of our campuses. Certainly in the past six months there's been a growing and growing evidence of public concern in our mass communications uh, newspapers and magazines and uh, television uh, programs, a growing public concern with what's happening on our campuses with respect to issues of freedom. But I think the public still tends to regard universities uh, in this respect as others, uh, as places apart from the larger society, places that ought to govern themselves. Uh, the courts have now begun to see bits and pieces of the problems of freedom in our campuses that have begun to surface now in litigation. And by and large, the courts have reacted with what I think is entirely justified bewilderment at the erosion of principle they've encountered. But of course, I think the last place that universities ought to look for protection of their academic freedom is the courts. After all, private colleges and universities, such as, as Yale, are in most cases not subject to the First Amendment because their actions are not those of the state. And judges will rightly want to approach issues of freedom inside universities with considerable deference based on our longstanding social traditions of academic autonomy. No, I think if freedom of thought is to be protected and preserved in our universities, it is the universities themselves and all of us who care about them that must have the clarity of purpose and the determination to protect the essential principles of liberty on which the academic mission must rest, must rest, I think, in a free society. This issue of freedom I want to relate to uh, broader concerns that I have uh, for a moment about colleges and universities. I think that this is a time of considerable uncertainty and confusion in colleges and universities about many of the fundamental principles and values on which the whole enterprise of higher education rests or, or at least ought to rest, uh, as it seems to me. These are not simple matters, I, I understand. Universities are, are always, ever, in a kind of search for themselves and their fundamental values. In the best and most confident of times, the pursuit of knowledge and the search for truth in a university can only go forward effectively in an atmosphere of continuing criticism where there are challenges to the inherited wisdom of the past and a continuing revision of our understanding. 
The problem I see today is that many universities seem to have forgotten that this search, the search for their own values, the search as, to use the great phrase of John Henry Newman from a century ago, the search for, as he put it, the idea of the university, that this search and this idea is perhaps the greatest lesson that universities can present to the young and to the old that look to them for understanding. But instead of this search for fundamental purpose and value and the defense of these values, I have to say there is considerable evidence of drift today in our universities. One can see it in the exposure of the uh, curriculum to the uh, crudest uh, kind of political pressures on the campus. I think one can see it in the willingness of many universities to do practically anything anybody will pay for. And I think one can see it in the, in the weakness currently of, of the great traditions of liberal education in many universities in the face of the most short-sighted and uh, narrow-minded sort of utilitarianism about higher education as if the purpose of education were training for a job rather than preparation for life. I mention a particularly egregious example in, of this drift and absence of strong values in the corruptions of uh, big-time college athletics at many universities, where educational values have been all but lost in the deluge of the search for money and a kind of uh, win-at-all-costs uh, attitude uh, toward athletics. Now, pressures of this kind always exist in universities, or at least so it seems to me from my study of their history. These pressures are perennial. But what is odd about our time now is how little it seems to me academic values and principles are pushing back against these perennial pressures. And the problems of freedom on our campuses uh, that I want to talk with you about this evening are, I think, part and parcel of this larger problem in our campuses of the absence of a firm sense of grounding in the principles and values uh, that higher education has given us over the years and over the centuries. Uh, it's hard to adhere uh, to principle these days. The very validity of the idea of enduring principle, including principles of freedom, are subject to the tremendous skepticism that pervades our age. It takes considerable uh, learning and investment of thought and some considerable confidence to prevent this skepticism from sweeping just about everything before it. Moreover, adherence to principle always requires the long view, the long view. And universities and the people in them, no less than the other institutions uh, in our society today, are subjected to hydraulic pressures of the immediate. Universities, too, have uh, become saturated with politics in our time, often politics of a fiercely partisan kind. They've become, uh, since the Vietnam period, I think, a kind of uh, anvil on which young people and often older people as well beat out their resentments not only about the incompleteness of the university, but the incompleteness of life and the world beyond the university. So this is a difficult time for the protection uh, and the defense of principle 
uh, at universities. And one of the most disturbing examples of this, I believe, is the large growing number of campuses around the country that have elected to try to punish and prevent rather than to answer and respond to speech that for one reason or another offends deeply rooted notions of civility and academic community. This tendency to suppress rather than answer I think is wrong, it's wrong in general for our society and wrong in principle for institutions that above any in our society ought to be committed to the widest possible latitude for freedom of thought. I would remind you that the oldest lesson of our experience with freedom in Western civilization, the oldest lesson is that offensive, erroneous, and obnoxious speech is the price of liberty. Such speech cannot be suppressed on a broad basis without stifling the search for truth and without creating an engine for censorship that will be very difficult to control. Consider with me for a moment why freedom of thought must be the essential value of a university. The great aim of education, after all, is to try to light the search for knowledge with the spark of imagination and to liberate the mind, to liberate the mind from thinking that is inert, uh, habitual, and dulled by convention. Ideas are alive. They need the invigoration of fresh thought. Ideas that don't live become, over time, suffocating straitjackets. Because ideas live, because imagination is therefore the key to wisdom, John Stuart Mill was right to contend that if we try to suppress that which we believe to be an error, even very offensive error, we lose a benefit as great as truth itself, namely, as he put it, the clearer perception and the livelier impression of truth produced by its collision with error. On many of the great questions of life, truth may be a matter of reconciling opposites, of weighing competing values, of trying to keep the mind open and free to new light, even as we hold to convictions uh, about which we are convinced. History provides, doesn't it, example after example of dogmas that were held most passionately and defended most obdurately against new truths that even cruel suppression over many years could not deny. That, it's that lesson that led Justice Holmes to write in his greatest free expression opinion that time has upset many fighting faiths, as he put it. And so he said the principle of free thought means not free thought for those who agree with us, but freedom for the thought that we hate. The dominant principle of the university must be freedom of thought. I prize highly values of civility, mutual respect, harmony, and even politeness within the university. But if these values collide with freedom of expression, the lesson of our history, I deeply believe, is that freedom must be the paramount value and obligation in an academic community. I know, as you do, that much expression that should be free may deserve our contempt 
we may well be moved to exercise our own freedom of expression to counter it. Much of it we may well ignore as literally beneath contempt. But we must not give in to the temptation to censor or suppress this sort of erroneous and offensive expression as we might see it now in a university without violating what seems to me the university's very justification for existence. A free people in a free university seeking to open and liberate their minds in the search for truth must try to develop the courage and the composure to face ideas and struggle with them, even though they may think them fraught with evil. I think to stifle expression because it is obnoxious or embarrassing or not instrumental to some political or ideological end, to stifle it, I think, is quite apart from being a grotesque invasion of the rights of others as a disastrous reflection on ourselves. When we stifle expression, it seems to me, we're elevating our fear and our ignorance over our capacity for a liberated and humane mind. This is why I believe that there is no speech so horrendous in content that it does not in principle serve our purposes, although we may have better things to do than to, than to listen to it. Mill was right. Even very egregious error sharpens our perception of the truth. And if that fails to persuade you, I say that we are always invariably thrust by offensive expression into a better awareness of what it is that we may think is our enemy. Let me mention two areas in which this problem of freedom of expression, freedom for unorthodox or unpopular speech, two areas where the, these problems present themselves, in particular in universities today. The first is the problem that we read about with distressing frequency, the problem of, uh, of actual disruption or prevention on the university, in the university, of unpopular or controversial speakers. Two decades ago, in a time of turmoil uh, at Yale and on other campuses, unpopular speakers were hounded down, harassed, prevented from delivering such messages as support for the Vietnam War, questioning of the civil rights movement, or a whole variety of uh, intellectual uh, and research questions. Among those whose speech at that time uh, among those whose speech was throttled included high-ranking military officials, governors of several states, uh, cabinet uh, officers in the national government, as well as the sort of assortment of eccentrics that's at any and all times like to peddle their wares uh, on university campuses. I think that period in which so many speakers, unpopular speakers, were hounded down was a shameful period of censorship and practice on our campuses. And the real victims of this suppression were the students and the faculty who did not have their own convictions and their own fierce partisan presuppositions tempered by exposure to other points of view, even if they would conclude in the end that those other points of view uh, we're wrong. But beyond the, beyond the damage caused by the many speakers who were prevented from speaking was the more general pall of conformity that these acts of suppression induce on campuses when they are permitted. I think history demonstrates that freedom of expression needs the firm protection of law in an open society in order for it, in order for freedom to flourish. Free speech, after all, is for most of us 
rather easily intimidated or deterred. From these views, I think it follows, so I believe, that a university, this is certainly my view at Yale, can never accept that an unpopular speaker should be threatened or disrupted. A university should never, in my view, connive in a withdrawal of an invitation to an unpopular speaker. I think if there's a threat of disruption or even violence, a university must not let this become a pretext for discouraging or preventing a speaker, an unpopular speaker, from coming to campus to speak. My own view is that the principle of freedom must be protected in the case of an unpopular speaker just as vigorously as it would be if some person or group threatened to burn offensive books in our library. I do not perceive the difference. That is why I reacted so strongly earlier this year in the belief that essential principles of academic freedom were violated at Yale when, according to most reports, Health and Human Services Secretary Lewis Sullivan was shouted down and effectively prevented from making himself heard to a group that had invited him to speak. That seems to me an assault on the foundation of principle that lies at the heart of a free university. In this area of, law, of lawless disruption or threats against unpopular speakers, I think the issue on campuses today is not so much the articulation of proper principles, but rather the vigor with which universities choose to defend these principles. I know uh, from personal experience uh, how easy it is to fall into the temptation to treat an invitation by some group on the campus to uh, some extremist uh, or offensive speaker as a sort of nuisance and indeed reflecting often a desire to ferment trouble and get some attention rather than a desire to contribute to serious discourse on the campus. But even if this is true, I think, it is also true, as I've tried to insist at Yale, that the freedom of such speakers on our campus goes right to the heart of the academic freedom we all enjoy at Yale. However bizarre or offbeat or eccentric or outrageous a speaker may be, his or her right to speak on our campuses, I think, presents as serious an issue of principle as any we can be confronted with. It is, after all, in the protection of such outrageous and offensive speakers that we create the shelter of principle under which all our freedoms are protected. Let me turn to a second related issue of freedom of expression in universities, an issue that is in a way the reverse of the one I've just been describing, an issue not of the abuse of freedom within the university, but of the actual use of university authority to suppress offensive speech. This is the most serious area of confusion of principle in university governance today. I want to emphasize that the problems in this area are almost always a result of the best of intentions. These are problems that recall Brandeis's wisdom, that the greatest threats to freedom of expression don't come from tyranny but from well-meaning persons who have little understanding. 
Aside from the recognition of religious liberty and the principle of the free exercise of religion and the separation of church and state, I think there is no principle in the history of freedom of thought in this country more basic and more important than the principle that offensiveness as such cannot be the basis for suppressing expression if expression is to be free. As I said before, if offensiveness becomes the basis for suppression, we have let loose a lethal and vague engine of censorship we will not be able to control. And I also want to repeat the impact of this suppression is not only felt by people whose speech is actually punished. The greater problem is the far greater number of speakers who will steer clear of possible punishment by steering clear of controversial or unpopular views. The chilling effect of vague powers to punish offensive speech I think are more likely to be damaging to freedom of expression than the actual applications of such rules. Now history has singled out a few, a few narrow categories of expression that are thought to be especially dangerous and essentially worthless in terms of the values of free expression that can be punished, even in a regime of freedom. One of these is threats. Another is a blackmail. Uh, th there are others. Clear expressions of intended violence or lawless behavior that are directed to identified individuals. It's one thing our history teaches us to be offended in general by some obnoxious speech, and another altogether to be directly threatened with menacing behavior, such as a, a verbal assault. And so we've recognized this category of threats in our legal tradition as one that it is appropriate, necessary indeed, to punish in order to maintain the larger freedoms on which our institutions depend. But I have to say to you, having spent many years studying these matters, that there is no more important line in our entire corpus of freedom than the line between these few narrow categorical expressions, such as threats that can be punished, and on the other hand, the whole vague, huge area of offensive and obnoxious speech generally. We've seen over and over again that if concerns about specific narrow dangers are permitted to balloon into vague justifications for punishing any expression that offends, free expression is effectively lost, then any statement that might give offense is at risk. And yet, in many universities, perhaps most universities today, it, it is precisely this critical line that has been blurred, or on some campuses, lost entirely in the well-intentioned, as I said, effort to create a civil, harmonious, and inoffensive uh, community. I remind you that on many campuses there is much that gives offense to one group or another. Some of the finest universities in this country, uh, ones for which I have the greatest respect, have adopted rules which I have to say I think empower groups of faculty and students with roving commissions to punish certain kinds of offensive speech.
At the University of Michigan, for example, before a judge intervened, uh, students and others could be subject to discipline for statements that, quote, stigmatizes or victimizes on the basis of race, ethnicity, religion, sex, sexual orientation, creed, national origin, ancestry, age, marital status, handicap, or Vietnam era veteran status, or, or that creates an intimidating, hostile environment for educational pursuits. Now, if you wondered what that means, there was a helpful pamphlet that came out that listed examples of the kind of speech that could be punished. I quote from this pamphlet, a male student makes remarks in class like, quote, women just aren't as good in this field as men, close quote, punishable. Another example from this pamphlet of punishable speech, and I quote again, your student organization sponsors a comedian who slurs Hispanics, close quote. So along with almost boundless notions of offensiveness, we've thrown in guilt by association. In a case which uh, sought to apply this uh, vague stuff, uh, a federal judge threw it all out. The University of Wisconsin, another of one of our greatest university, uh, and by the way, I <laughs> hasten to say, the presidents of both these universities uh, are friends whom I admire a lot. The University of Wisconsin pro promulgated a, a similar prohibition about what it called, uh, quote, racist or discriminatory comments that intentionally demean the race, sex, religion, and the similar list of any person or persons and create a hostile environment for education. Again, a little explanatory uh, example indicated that uh, jokes that have the purpose of making the environment hostile to anyone are examples of the sort of things that uh, could be punished. At the University of uh, Pennsylvania, one can be punished for any comments that stigmatize individuals and create an, quote, offensive academic living or work environment. Let me make a few comments about the recent case at Brown University that has received such widespread attention lately in the press. I hope if there are any journalists here, you will include in what I'm about to say the following. I speak with the greatest respect for this great university, and I know its president, whom I count as a good friend, to be a dedicated proponent of freedom. I also I want to make clear I know nothing about the Brown case beyond what I've read, but the allegations trouble me considerably. Now, the student who was expelled, if the allegations were true, it seems to me might have been justifiably expelled for issuing a threat to an identified uh, other student, indeed, a whole series of students, as it seems. The, the problem that I have is that the rule under which discipline was imposed and the students were, was, was expelled, this rule forbids brown students from, quote, subjecting another person, group, or class of persons to inappropriate, inappropriate, abusive, threatening, or demeaning action based on race and the, 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 the list of concerns. As I read that, that means that you can be subject to discipline if you engage in inappropriate action 
in the eyes of the group of students and faculty and administrators that uh, decide after the fact what speech should be tre treated as, quote, inappropriate action. So I think that while the facts of the particular case may well have been within the very narrow category of threats that our free speech theory and our practice have long accepted as necessary, the rule that authorized this discipline seems uh, vastly wider um, to me, indeed in its terms, almost boundless. I'd point out that these vague and open-ended rules that I've been describing uh, are typically enforced by faculty and by students who, uh, with the best efforts and intentions, are untutored in the central lessons of the history of freedom of expression, and who in many cases uh, act and speak of their actions as if they think that general offensiveness and breaches of civility on campus ought to be punished, even if freedom of expression is the losers, is the loser. Uh, campuses today are replete with suggestions that vague notions of community and values of civility are more important to the academy, are of higher value than freedom of thought and expression. Such a view, I have to say again, is in practice and in principle disastrous to the independence and the creativity of students and faculty. This line, this line that I described between a few narrow categories of punishable expression and these broad and vague notions of offensive and inappropriate speech, this line is, is not a scholastic subterfuge. It is a hard-bought lesson in the history of freedom, and it's a lesson that is being lost on many of our campuses. Now, I have said of the Brown case that it seems to me the actions involved would have justified punishment, and I want to repeat that. To me, the most disturbing aspect of that case was not actually what I understand to have happened at Brown, but the response, the complacent response of so many others who ought to have known better. An editorial in the New York Times exhibited that peculiar complacence about other people's freedom that the press so often uh, exhibits, in my opinion. This editorial, believe it or not, took the position approvingly that because Brown is a private university and therefore is not bound by the First Amendment, that it need not treat, treat freedom of expression as a paramount value and could therefore balance the needs of freedom and the needs of civility and harmony on the campus. If there is one thing that decades of First Amendment adjudication have taught us, it is that vague balancing formulas where freedom is balanced against other broad and vague values. Even in the hands of disciplined judges, vague balancing formulas tends to result in a major erosion of freedom in practice. What can we expect of such formulations in the hands of students and faculty, however well-meaning they are? I'd like to argue in conclusion uh, some general views that uh, I'm sorry to say I think are strikingly at odds with the tenor of much of what I've been describing. 
First, I would like to urge upon you the view that universities are institutions that need to be even more free than the freedom we enjoy in our civil society, which I recognize is the greatest, greatest degree of freedom of expression that any society in human history has ever enjoyed. But universities are dedicated to an academic mission that calls, in my view, for the search for truth under the most complete possible conditions of freedom. In order for the creativity and imagination and the challenges and the liberation of mind that should go on in a university. Universities are also dedicated to the proposition that they ought to try to teach people within them how to think. And in our day, perhaps in every day, that requires being able to face threatening and obnoxious views with courage uh, and composure. So I would like to take issue with the New York Times and urge that universities ought to be more committed to freedom than the larger civil society and that private universities, no less than public ones, indeed arguably more, ought to commit themselves to freedom. If that principle is right, then the, the tendency of so many universities, the tendency of that editorial in the Times, to see the values of civility and harmony and uh, goodwill as in some sense equivalent values for the university to defend as the values of freedom, that view is wrong and it will not result in the long run in a true balance, I believe, but in a profound erosion of freedom in our universities, an erosion which will further the tendency of those places to a kind of conformity uh, in any event. Universities need the benefit of freedom, even freedom of obnoxious and eccentric and, as I said, erroneous thought uh, and speech. And so I uh, express a, a concluding hope that I realize is uh, not in character uh, with our age of anxiety on our campuses, a hope that universities would commit themselves anew to the paramount value of freedom in their, among their internal values and their internal governance. We can survive the expression of offensive speech in our universities. We can answer it if need be. We can do that because in our universities in the United States, we rest on great traditions of freedom and the liberated mind. If we would be true in our universities to the teachings, and the examples, not only of Brandeis and, and Holmes and the great thinkers about freedom in American history, but Milton and Locke and even going back to Socrates, if we would be true to these great traditions in our universities, we must not permit the erosion of freedom. Thank you very much. I'd be delighted to take some questions. <clears throat> Yes. If you could speak as loudly as possible, I'll repeat the questions. Please. Yes. 
Uh, the question was, in the first place, I talk a lot about freedom, uh, f freedom, f freedom for whom? Um, and the second question was whether uh, on universities or otherwise I see a tension between the values of freedom and the principles uh, of equality uh, in the, I assume, in the 14th Amendment. Uh, my answer is that the freedom within universities is, is the freedom for everyone within the university. Now, I, it does not follow from that that you know, anybody who wants to in the world can, uh, uh, can come to Yale and decide to give a speech in uh, a classroom that's supposed to be devoted to classical civilization at 10 o'clock in the morning on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Uh, Yale is, is not the larger society, but any student at Yale, any faculty member at Yale, and anybody who's invited to Yale has, in my view, the same freedom. And the freedom of someone who is offended by speech is the freedom to respond, to respond, not in a way that prevents someone else from speaking, but to respond, to answer. That's, that seems to me the freedom. Now, there, there is in the, in the in the thinking that, uh, that is sort of characteristic of our age, the notion is, as your question suggested, that, that, that there is a tension between the values of freedom and the goals of equality uh, on campuses and within the larger society. Uh, I, I'm sorry to say I don't believe, th I, I don't agree with that. I, I think that's fundamentally wrong. Uh, freedom is for everyone. And uh, in fact, the history of freedom in this country, I think by and large, demonstrates the special value of free expression for groups that are disadvantaged, victimized by unequal treatment, unequal laws, uh, unequal practices. Uh, if they're, uh, I think history is pretty clear that, that, that groups that are disadvantaged, abused, victimized, seems to me ought to be the last groups that ask for the creation of general engines of suppression. Because uh, uh, oh, it's, uh, I, don't, I don't look at this thing politically, but I just say to anyone who does look at it politically, I don't think it's the right way to look at it, but it's, it's, uh, it's fatuous to believe, uh, not sure, sure you don't, but some, fatuous to believe that uh, if engines of suppression are created in our universities, it will be mainly the dispossessed and the left and so on who will operate them. Not in the long run. Engines of suppression are available for whoever has the power in the, in the end. And that's why I think freedom is, the, is in many ways... Uh, uh, a, 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 a principle that, that all groups, including groups that feel uh, unequally treated and victimized, ought to be devoted to. Uh, yes? Um, I've read some of your stuff. You and I don't agree about this. <laughs> but it's very interesting. <laughs> Well, to answer the last question first, uh, the question is, when is politics appropriate in shaping a university uh, curriculum? I, I, I'm old-fashioned on this. I mean, I, I know that one of, the, 
kind of modern theories is that everything is full of politics, you know, including art and uh, and uh, so, so, sort of so-called neutral principles. I, I'm old-fashioned. I don't believe that. It seems to me that the purpose of universities in the curriculum uh, is is not to respond to the political pressures from whatever group, students or whatever. It's uh, I, I, it's like if universities teach the society the lesson that their curriculum is the consequence of political pressure, that political pressure will come from all kinds of forces in the society that can even mount more pressure than the feminist community in the student body at Yale, in my opinion. So I think it is in the interest, actually, of all of us, including that community, to try to make the case, which is, I think, an easy case to make in this particular example, to try to make the case that that, that neutral considerations of, of academic value and interest ought to call for a more creative reflection in the curriculum of some of these uh, I, new, new approaches that are, that are intellectually interesting in themselves. It's not that they are backed by political uh, interests. The curriculum of a university ought to be devoted to the search for understanding and to the best that the wisdom of experience and the continuing process of critical revision of thought that goes on constantly in universities. That's what ought to shape the curriculum and, and not politics. If, if a curriculum becomes open to a political free-for-all, uh, the search, the idea of the university's dead. May I just respond to the first part about diversity? You know, it's often said that, uh, I, I hear this often from my colleagues who are presidents of, of other universities whom, whom I try to convince on these matters, usually not successfully. That well, uh, they say, Benno, that's all very well. All this talk about freedom for the old days of the uh, homogenous uh, university. But that in conditions of, of current diversity, with not only all the uh, creativity and breadth of interest that that brings, but the, some tensions that that brings, and greater political interest that that brings, Freedom needs to give way now because the diversity that we have requires that we give more value to community. I say it's just the opposite. It's just the opposite. The more diverse and varied the viewpoints of any community, the more essential it is that that community be devoted to freedom so that various viewpoints can try to make their way in the in the in the competition of ideas. And uh, so I, I think the conditions of the modern university make it more rather than less essential that we make our paramount commitment to freedom. Uh, yes, sir, in the middle. Well, I hope you don't think I'm going to sort of fall into duck this semantically. No, freedom of expression, very clear. It does not extend to actual disruption of anyone else's right to speak. Now, what's disruption? Uh, that's a hard line to draw. <laughs> 
and a university, I think, when in doubt, a university should, should come on the side of freedom, I think. Uh, disruption, I think, must be very clear in its intention and in its effect for it to be regarded as that. So by disruption, I mean something that really prevents the class from being taught, prevents someone else from speaking. That's, that's not freedom of expression. That's a kind of practical censorship. Uh, that is, uh, that's intolerable. Uh, you, you mentioned the case of the Nazis. Uh, and uh, that is a serious, uh, that's a serious issue for anyone as, uh, who is, as I am, uh, devoted to freedom. My best answer to that is that uh, um, it was not speeches. It was speeches brigaded with violence and threats. To me, Hitler could speak at Yale so long as that's what he came to do and did, to speak. To me, it's no different than the question whether we should permit someone to burn Mein Kampf in the library. They're both grossly offensive. We can learn a lot from the grotesque offensiveness and danger that's represented in there if we will learn it. But it's when a speaker associates <coughs> his speech with the threat and the actual power of violence, then a, a, a viable society and one devoted to freedom will control the violence and punish it, try to crush it. And that's the way I would distinguish uh, the issue of, uh, of Hitler. Sir. I don't think, I think if you go that far, that is an argument that is uh, very frequently voiced uh, today at Yale and on, on other campuses. Uh, the difficulty with the argument is that it, it, it seems to me it proves too much. That is, there are all kinds of offensive ideas that if accepted as true are intimidating in some large sense uh, to various groups of people. But if you say that that warrants the suppression of such ideas, then you give, you know, we, you have to remember about all these ideas that somebody has to enforce it. How does it actually work? The way it actually works in universities is that a group of students and faculty then decide which of these general ideas are in a general way intimidating and interfere and so on. And then the sky's the limit. So I think it's necessary to limit very, very narrowly the idea of threat to the situation of basically it's a face-to-face -face threat or a personally directed, it can be in the mail, that realistically and intentionally makes someone feel they may be the object of violence or lawless conduct. And in the case of face-to-face -face insults that have this direct threatening quality. After all, the kind of insult, so-called fighting words, if you're a you know, First Amendment jargonist, that's the way you call it, fighting words. The idea there is that there are certain expressions which if flung right in somebody's face would in most cases provoke a fight, physical response. Therefore, the speaker wouldn't make it unless he or she was ready to fight. Therefore, it's a threat. It's a threat, you know. Uh, it's, and at, at that point, at that point, that's, that's discourse of a certain kind, but it's so brigaded with violence. It's the, Hitler, it's the Hitler issue, in a way, writ small. It's so brigaded with the threat of violence that no 
no orderly society can, can should uh, protect that. But when you go into general offensiveness, you've moved into a whole different, completely unbounded category. Uh, and the result, I think, is a, is a kind of conformity about certain very sensitive issues that one wants to see freely and openly discussed, even though the price of that is going to be a good deal of expression that is offensive and eccentric and you or I might not think constructive. That's the price of, of freedom, I think. Uh, yes, in the back row, yeah. Uh, well, I think you, one can run into some difficult tensions there. Uh, in general, in general, university, the problem had to do with a university group at the University of Michigan that was organized along religious lines and that following its fundamentalist group, that following its religious belief wanted to exclude gay people, lesbians, and then used their group status in some way to publish stuff and get, have access and so on. I, I think uh, groups on the campus ought to be open. But everyone on the campus should have a right to practice uh, their religion freely. And if that means a group in the course of its religious observances has a certain ritual and so on, I don't think that somebody can come in and say, hey, I want to be part of that. Uh, I, I think religious groups ought to be basically self-governing to the extent that they're engaged in what under the First Amendment would be called the free exercise of religion. But when they are enjoying university benefits and special benefits as a group, I don't think they should be able to discriminate. Yes, ma'am. Well, they're discussed at Yale, that's all I can say. Um, you know, I, they're discussed a lot at Yale, issues of affirmative action. And those are, uh, you know, there are a variety of views about that that, are, that tend, to be, uh, tend to be expressed. I suppose I think, uh, I mean, you're really asking kind of psychological speculation about this. No, I don't think that the, that the this move against, in the first place, the move against racist speech, uh, 
is part of a much larger process, as all these rules that I just read you a few samples of indicate. It's not just uh, speech that offends people on the basis of race that's uh, barred. It's speech that offends people on the basis of just about anything, in, and uh, including uh, uh, offending groups that are no part of the, uh, in, a, in a serious way, no part of the current affirmative action uh, activities of most universities. So I take it that this reflects not that so much as a general wish that finds itself expressed. You know, it's easy to understand. It's very well-intentioned. People ought to be nice. You know, universities ought to make everybody feel good. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. That makes me feel good. We'll be at the reception shortly. Universities ought to be harmonious. These are easy things to understand, and, and I think it's, it's not any more in relation to race than it is in relation to, to the other tensions that one finds uh, reflected in these, uh, uh, in these rules. We've got time for one more question, and then I know we've got to go to the uh, uh, reception. You've had your hand up a lot, sir, yeah. A university can respond when there are uh, egregious examples of that. A university can make clear its own values of non-discrimination and, and inclusion. A university can make clear on its campus the values that stem from diversity in the student body, in the curriculum, uh, in all the educational programs of the university. A university can answer, can answer uh, offensive speech, just as students uh, uh, should and, and, and do answer offensive speech. But to suppress it, to suppress it, as Brandeis taught years ago, uh, may have just the opposite of the effect intended. Free expression is, after all, a great safety valve for all kinds of crazy and obnoxious ideas, which, if bottled up, if pressed underground, can result in, in can erupt in ways far more damaging, far harder to control, far harder to deal with an answer than offensive speech. So it's a bad strategy, I think, as well as, uh, as, well as wrong in, in principle. We've, uh, I've kept you uh, beyond the time that I was supposed to. Thank you again very much. <clears throat> Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.